Hello and welcome to the latest in the University of York's Open Lectures. We're celebrating York Disability Week with an inspirational guest for you. Charlotte Ellis defied all the odds and became a paratriathlete. She's now a marathon runner. I know it sounds completely exhausting, doesn't it? Charlotte has been visually impaired since birth and despite the best efforts of school to discourage her from doing sport, Charlotte fought back and it was thanks to trampolining at the University of York which led her to achieve some of her greatest successes and it's an absolute honour to welcome Charlotte. Hello. Good morning Ellie, thank you. It's lovely to chat to you and a great honour to be asked to do this by the university that had such an impact on my life. We're going to hear about that over the next half hour or so. Um, how's COVID going? Let's get that out of the way first, because we're all living in this very, very strange world at the moment, aren't we? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a huge challenge for everyone. Obviously, the, the NHS doing a fantastic job for everyone. I'm fortunate to be in work, manically busy at work, trying to um, support children and young people. Um, but yeah, it's just trying to communicate work-wise and with friends and family in different ways. Um, and yeah, it just seems a very different world from the world we had this time last year. Because the job for you is you're actually supporting families and young people with special needs. Yes, I do. Yes. So there's um, a lot of making sure they get the services that they need. Um, I work in the homeschool transport team. So yeah, there's a lot of logistical challenges <laughs> um, on a day-to-day -day basis, shall we say. Let's talk about now. How it all started for you, you've had some amazing achievements and we will talk about that over the years. But let's find out a bit about the journey because unfortunately for you, school wasn't a great experience, was it? No, I suppose I was lucky in a sense that at home, I was always treated the same as any other child. So I did things my brother did, you know, I went on my bike, we played cricket in the garden, all those things. And certainly at primary school, I was included in all the usual ways. Looking back, those little things teachers did, like we had a brightly coloured handball, which, you know, but when I went up to senior school, there was things I wasn't allowed to do. I wasn't allowed to trampoline, wasn't allowed to play hockey. I was most not impressed with. Well, I did mean I got the bonus of double netball, which I liked. Um, and some of the fun things, like they used to play Mexican tennis in groups and it was a bit of a chat in the sunshine, which I wasn't allowed to do. I'd hit a sponge ball against the wall with a plastic racket, which... Yeah, not ideal when you're 12 year old that's kind of what you get a four-year-old to do um and a lot of the messages that I got for an impressionable young teenager weren't ideal you know it's not fair for you to play with the others I was told on a number of occasions I was even taken away from my best friend physically in an after-school club because it wasn't fair on her um so I suppose my expectations of achieving in sport were quite low even though I really enjoyed sport and I had friends who were like, oh, you're so lucky you get out of PE. And I'm like, I want to do <laughs> things. Quite resentful of like being told I couldn't because I, I don't think I really had the concept of why I couldn't. I just thought I should be allowed to um, so, do all some these things. There's some terrible experiences there. I mean, how did you cope with that at that time? Can you remember what those feelings were like? Because it's almost like a rejection, isn't it? I did feel very frustrated that sort of I really wanted to do something and I was being told I couldn't for a reason that to me didn't seem justifiable but also then I also had friends who didn't want to do PE who were quite envious of the fact that I was told I couldn't play in a hockey match <laughs> so it was kind of like that thing of like well you should feel happy about it but actually I really don't I really want to and I think I felt like I had something to prove but um that's as well where uni made a massive difference because I can remember doing activities with a trampolining club at uni and I was like oh I can't play this game because I won't be able to do it it's not fair on the others and they're kind of like they're, they said to me you know it's more important for us that you take part than the game's perfect and for somebody to actually say that to me was really quite emotional and something that was you know very important to me um, and suddenly having that change of like almost in secondary school I was expected to not be good at stuff and it was almost like, why? Like you'd do something in PE and it was like, oh, why haven't you dropped out yet type of thing? Um, as opposed to like uni where people were sort of telling me and, and since then, like, no, try this and have a go at this and you're better than you think you are, that type of thing. So yeah, school, school was a challenge from a sporting point of view. But having said that, I um, found circuitous routes. I went to a circus performing club um, and I went to a self-defense club. Um, 
I did briefly go to the athletics club, but I very much felt like I was a nuisance to the teachers. So I didn't. Oh actually... gosh. And um, when when I was talking to you before we were going to do this interview, you said something really interesting to me, which which I thought was a really just a fascinating way of looking at it and an understanding way of looking at it, which was you said to me. I don't think the adults understood. I don't think they got it. Why did you feel yeah. that? I think, I don't think anyone sets out to make a child not feel confident. I think that some of them were doing the things they felt was best. You know, I think the time, like when they said, I remember one time, um, it was the end, the last game of netball of the term, and they said, oh, it's not fair for you to play on the others. I think they were trying to give the others, the other children, a really nice treat at the end of term but I think they could have just found a way of saying that to me that wasn't quite as as blunt as harsh you know um you know I remember um I just nearly got my 25 meters in swimming and um I only missed getting it because I misjudged the side visually and then my swimming teacher changed and she wouldn't let me do it for two years even though I knew I could um and it just was like no you can't do it because of your sight and I just think to her, that made total sense. She wasn't trying to be cruel or unkind. There was other children in the group who couldn't swim 25 meters. And she just assumed because of my sight, then therefore I wouldn't be able to. And yeah, I think I think it's very important um, sometimes to accept, accept situations. I was watching, um, I don't know if anyone else interested in it, but I was watching the Six Nations once and then they were talking at half time. Johnny Wilkinson was saying something very interesting that really resonated with me, that it's important to accept a situation for what it is at the time, but you don't accept what the future is going to be. And I kind of think that's what I did with school. I realised that after so long of saying to teachers, well, I think I can trampoline, and being told, no, you absolutely can't, that I couldn't change that. But my determination was that in the future, I was going to change that because I wanted to trampoline. I wanted to do the Great North Run like my dad had done. So whether they thought I could or not wasn't really relevant to me in the sense of they weren't my future. They were the present. There's a great lesson for us all there and for young people as well. And I'm sure the story resonates in different ways with people where they went through school and they were told they couldn't do something, whatever that was. And then thought, do you know what? I'm just going to show you. And boy, did you show them, girl. You really, <laughs> really did, didn't you? Um, yeah. You mentioned there you did circus skills. Now, how on earth did you do the circus skills? Because, of course, you've had a visual impairment since you were you were a baby. Mm. And was there any fear there? Or is it a case of you didn't know any difference? So you just thought, do you know what? I'm just going to give it a go. Um, I think it was a case of I don't know any difference. So... Um, we had a circus performing club at my school at the time. Um, my brother had gone and I couldn't wait to go. And um, basically any skills they suggested, I had to go at. Um, I think I'd probably nearly give my mother heart failure by doing a thing <laughs> called web rope in a show where basically um, you climb to the top of the rope, did a rope to the top in the gym. And it was probably about um, eight foot high, maybe. It was definitely a lot of humour. And then basically you hang from one hand and someone spins you around. Oh, um, yeah, dead easy. Well, I do that every <laughs> weekend. <laughs> and um, uh, 11, 12-year-old, this seemed a, a thing that I wanted to do. It was something I quite enjoyed. Um, and, yeah, I just I just tried things and found ways of adapting. I mean, I have to say, um, the circus teacher, who who is still um, someone I've met again, and so... The circus club stopped after a couple of years, um, the way these things do. But a few years ago, um, I started trapeze, and it's with the same teacher. So Kathy is a very inspirational, supportive teacher who is willing to look at things differently and understands that, for instance, when I'm doing trapeze, I might not be able to do a transition where you've got to um, go straight to the bar because I might not be able to visually see that, but I might find a way of making my transition artistic in a different way. Um, so I think, you know, groups like that were really helpful in building some elements of confidence. And yeah, um, just, I guess it, I just wanted to try. I'd see other people doing things and think, oh, I want to have a go at that. And why not? 
why not? Um, you, you've already alluded to it that actually the trampoline club at the University of York was a bit of a saviour really, wasn't it? Just talk us through what it was like leaving home to go to university because I'm sure that your parents, you talk there about your mum, you know, absolutely terrified when you're doing the trapeze and, and doing the circus act. But for your parents to see you go to university, it must have been filled with mixed emotions because there you were going off to be independent, but also at the same time, they would worry about you as well. Yeah, I'm, I know they did. And I know it was a big transition. I was um, very lucky. I lived in, my, my housemates were fantastic. Um, and, um, and I know she probably will listen to this, but one of my housemates, Kate, um, was probably one of the most inspirational people in my life. She went running with me for the first time. Um, she made me realise that it's, it's okay to be not okay. Something I was very much taught as a, a child, if there was something I was upset about because of my sight, if I'd been picked on or if, if um, I wasn't allowed to do something, I kind of was quite often told, well, there's other children who are worse off, there's the children who can't see anything. So I was very much like not um, encouraged to feel that it was okay sometimes to be not okay. And Kate, very much, I remember being upset about something that happened and it had happened because I hadn't been able to see something and um, that, and then like I say, going running with her and she went to the trampoline club with me for the first time and then going to the trampoline club and just being accepted and encouraged to do competitions and it it wasn't actually about how good you were it was about being one of the group and and I really did make some of the most amazing friends through trampolining and through university in general um that yeah it, I, I don't think I would be where I am today without having gone to the University of York and without having joined the trampoline club and met the people that I did well, well done to the trampoline club all those years ago. Well, not too many years ago, but <laughs> wel welcoming you and, and being accepting as well, because, mm. you know, that, that, that's a huge step, a huge step for you. And also it's been the road to an incredible career, which is continuing as an athlete. So tell us about that first run. You mentioned there that your housemate Kate went out running with you. Did you like running or was it just something yeah. to do? Yeah, no, so I'd always wanted to run. My dad used to do the Great North Run. I can remember being very small and saying to my dad, when I'm big, I'm going to run that with you. And it was always this ambition. And I think because of school, I'd sort of thought, oh, we're really good at running. Even though when I look back, I wasn't last at the 1500 metres. And I actually enjoyed the 1500 metres um, at school. Um, and I enjoyed cross country, which most people hated running around the sand dunes, um, you know. So um, how, it, how it sort of came about was by a bit of a fluke. We'd, we'd gone for a walk, a group of us. Um, and then as you do when you're a student, you think it's a great idea to go for a paddle. And then we decided to run up the hill to warm up. And then um, we just got chatting and I said, I kind of quite fancy trying running. Um, and we went running a bit and then we did the race for life. Um, and then I suppose during uni, I tried a lot to find different guides and I was very fortunate in meeting another person who was um, critical in my life, Kerry, um, who did a lot of running with me and I was the first person I went on a tandem bike with. Um, and yeah, um, it took a while. Looking back, I maybe could have made more opportunities if I'd been a little bit more confident with my running because I, I kind of always assumed I wasn't as good as other people. Um, I wouldn't have joined my running club at home, but my best friend, when I came home, because I got my job, my first job near home, my best friend had joined our local running club and she was like, oh, join. And I was like, oh, I don't know, like, not sure I'll be good enough, really. I don't want to keep everyone waiting. Um, and it was it was Louise who said, you know, join and see. And then I met another group of fantastic people who, again, encouraged me to try different things and, yeah, um, give me the opportunity to to see how far I could go. Well, you went a long way and you continue to go a long way. And um, tell us about the first big break because it wasn't just the running that you did, was it? You went into what was, what, you were a bit of a guinea pig really because it was the disabled triathlon squad in 2008. Were you building up to that? Were you building up to be a, to be a you know, to do the um, triathlon? I think I'd always fancied doing triathlon. I sort of had a bucket list of things like the Great North Run and the marathon and the triathlon. 
Um, and I'd done different sports at uni as well. I'd done dance and of various types and yoga and I'd done aerobics. And when I came home, I pretty much was mainly just running and I kept looking at a few things, but with work, it was trying to fit it in. And obviously I don't drive, so it was travel. Um, and then um, strangely, um, and I remember quite distinctly, it was back in November, 2007, I had the same email from two totally different people on the same day, one to my work email address and one to my home email address saying, they're doing a project to get visually impaired people to try a triathlon. Do you want to, basically, do you want to volunteer? And I thought, oh yeah, that's a great opportunity. So it was to do the London triathlon. Um, and I did it. And there was a few um, minor mishaps with a bit of a lengthy transition with a few issues and things, but really enjoyed it. Did another one a couple of weeks later and then I got an email um, maybe a month or two after that saying, do you want to join the disabled triathlon squad? It's like a new thing. It's a development sport. And again, I was like, oh, I don't really think I'll be good enough like, to join anything like that. I've only done two triathlons. I'm not um, a particularly brilliant swimmer. I'd, I'd swum a bit as a child. And then for um, other reasons, I'd kind of dropped swimming you know, I ran and cycled a tandem bike and that was it. And then, um, yeah, they asked me to join. Um, and in 2009, I did my first international, but um, unfortunately, um, my guide hurt her arm. So I, had to, I was guided by a male um, guide and I was really ill because I'd got food poisoning from another track on the week, um, two weeks before. So I don't really remember much of that race and I didn't count in the results. Um, so then effectively my first official international was um, in 2010 and that was the real big break um, so in 2010 I won world and European championships in paratriathlon um, for visually impaired women um, and silver at the world duathlon so that was sort of a huge year for me of kind of being like wow and then you sort of think okay maybe that was all a fluke maybe that was just something that happened and then 2011, um, we won the Worlds and Europeans again. Um, and that was, that was an amazing year and really lucky to go to some amazing places because um, the World Championships that year was in Beijing. The European Championships was in a place in Spain called Pontevedra. It's an absolutely beautiful part of Spain. Um, and we were making friends. I mean, I've got a friend who's a Spanish triathlete, Susanna, you know, um, friends from other categories with other disabilities. So yeah, it was it was a massive move forwards. I think people will be fascinated by the fact that throughout you've never had that confidence, yet here you are. Look at the success that you you had as a as a para triathlete, and that that absolutely fascinates me. And, and I'm sure it is the same for everybody else because you through that time there still was, was that lack of confidence. Why, mm. why, do you, why do you think that was? I think that fundamentally in a lot of people, when someone gives you a compliment, the likelihood is they're a friend, they're a family member, they're a colleague, they're someone who you know, probably someone who you like and respect. So there's always that thing where you think, are they just being nice? When someone gives you not a good compliment, not, um, is not kind to you or makes you feel not good enough, you tend to believe that more and I think I'd never set out although I did watch the Olympics and Paralympics and think yeah I want to be that person I don't know how much I actually believed that dream would ever come true so um I think there was um an element of and because it happened so quickly I almost think there was a part of me that kept thinking actually at some point I'm going to wake up and this isn't going to be real um so yeah it was a big a big thing and um it did take time I think um I think as well like in a way getting so now that I've changed to marathon running and last year I was selected to represent Great Britain at the world championships for marathon um it was quite nice to get selected in another sport because then I felt like almost that was a bit more of a validation and it was something where it very much was my own ability. Like it's nice in triathlon because it's a guide and it's a partnership and it's still a partnership in running because I couldn't run without a guide. But sometimes when I did triathlon, people used to say things like, well, it's the guide's ability on the bike or, mm, well, no, you know. No. 
they really said that that it's actually yeah. their ability and not yours that, that, that must yeah. be so hurtful it's quite hurtful and then you have to do you do you think well actually i've done a test on a turbo or a what bike like a, a solo static bike and actually thinking no it's not it's not them it is a combination of both of us um so yeah i think um you know there was a lot of challenges confidence wise um it to to overcome um but I think it, it was hugely rewarding and the people that I met both um teammates fellow competitors the places I got to visit um and the achievements and I think the first real re time that it seemed real to me which I remember distinctly we didn't have um the first year that I won world Europeans we didn't have um our national anthems we just had medal ceremonies and kind of you got your medal and then you that was it you had a photo were you disappointed by that because for me I would think that standing there on the podium and the national anthem playing just must make you feel fantastic it does so that when we so I wasn't disappointed because I think I accepted it for what it was but the first time that um in Spain in Ponte Vedra when we, I won the European Championships the second time and I stood on the podium and they were playing our anthem and our race had been earlier and then they'd had the elite men's race, then they'd had their medal ceremony and then ours. And we were in a stadium and it was like, actually, this is real. And this anthem is playing because me and, and Jenny, my guide, we've just won. And that that was kind of a bit of like a realization moment. Um, and we had commentary on that. So our run went through the stadium a couple of times and, you know, someone actually commentating on me competing and, um, the time we went through the stadium twice so um the time we went through in the middle of the race I was in the process of overtaking people so to have someone commentating on that was really special and yeah that was when it started to sort of sink in that this isn't just something that that happened by a bit of a fluke well it certainly wasn't a fluke and congratulations on winning all those medals how many medals did you win in the end for for the triathlete for the para triathlete so I won three European titles, um, two world titles, um, a world bronze. I came fourth in worlds, but I quite badly damaged my foot that year. That was so frustrating because I was really struggling in that race with my foot. And I um, um, and then I won a couple of sil um, a silver at Europeans as well, um, world aquathlon silver and world duathlon silver. So aquathlon's swim run mm. and... Um, duathlons run bike run so yeah it was um, quite an eventful few years <laughs> it certainly was an eventful few years not bad for somebody who at school was told you can't do sport so why the transition why did you say I mean is is triathlon is it too exhausting or is a marathon easier how does it work how do you change from one to the other I think I'd always wanted to do a marathon I had reached a point where I felt that my swim wasn't improving I the swim was almost my biggest weakness um, in the triathlon. I think it was said to me quite plainly, you basically ring your races on the run. And I was like, yes, I do. And um, if, um, you know, I had invested a lot of time um, and I was getting quite conflicting advice by that point. You know, one person said, do this, one person do, said, do that. And it just wasn't moving forwards. And I think I just decided that really I wanted to focus on running um, I knew that um, marathon running for visually impaired women was starting to become more high profile and that, you know, that was a good, had I achieved everything I could in triathlon, um, you know, so I think it just seemed a good time to move forward. Um, I then sustained an injury in 2014, which to be honest would have probably meant I didn't have much of a triathlon season anyway, because I fragmented my big toe joint in a bit of a freak accident Ouch. um so then it was quite a long way back um to then actually do my first marathon um and I maybe rushed that slightly because I got injured um just be or picked up a slight niggle just beforehand so I didn't have the best race um so yeah it was a long journey of getting used to the marathon the marathon's a very different challenge um you know it, it's about pacing yourself it's about nutrition strategies getting your legs used to running for that length of time getting your legs used to the, the volume of training. Um, triathlon's a challenge to train for because it's three different sports and um, effectively 
I need someone to pilot a tandem, so anything would, and I need someone to guide me on open water swim. So, and even in a pool, I can swim on my own, but it's restricted to lane swims when it's quiet. So, it's a lot to juggle triathlon. Running's a lot more straightforward. I mean, I have my own treadmill, and I um, have a safe place where I can can actually run solo, um, which has been a massive help during lockdown. Um, and and locally, I think a lot of people. Um, around the red car area certainly know me and, and know my visually impaired top which basically highlights to them keep away I guess um, but um, yeah um, and I think running is what I really really enjoy and I think I just was at that point with triathlon I'd fallen out of love with triathlon a bit um, and I suppose yeah I mean I've, I've worked full-time I did reduce my hours slightly at one point in my triathlon career, but pretty much I've worked full time throughout all my sporting, um, you know, uh, career. So it's it's a lot to juggle work and training. And with both sports, you need to do strength and conditioning, and you need to do all the prehab things that reduce the risk of injury. So yeah, it was. Um, I think it was a, a lifestyle change as much as anything, and a new challenge. And yeah, I. I'm so glad I did it because to have been selected to run for Great Britain and was a huge honour. I mean, I was excited to be selected for triathlon, but to be ex- asked to run for Great Britain, you know, when you've watched the Olympics and the Paralympics and to run through the streets of London in GB kit was just something else. And, um, you know, so that was that was last year in our World Championships. And had it not been for COVID, I would have done the World Cup this year. So yeah, which which is must be a huge huge disappointment. You're just talking about EGB strip. You've got it on today, haven't you? Yeah, I've got our presentation kit on. It's it's um this is athletics kit. Do you want me to? Yeah, that will be good. Look at that, fantastic. Um, but yeah, so um, I am fortunate to have yeah represented Britain in two sports, and it, it's just a, a huge honour to have been asked to do that and. Um, incredible incredible achievement just very briefly because I know we've got a lot of questions to ask you Charlotte um what about the guide how important is that relationship between you and your guide and yeah I'm so glad you've asked that because I am so lucky in some of the guides I have they're absolutely amazing people from like say Kate and Kerry who first got me into running my best friend Louise who's guided me all over the place quite often on routes that people didn't think we should run on um I think people would say things like oh no we can't go on that route because Charlotte's with us and Louise would be like yeah we've run it loads of times it'll be fine (laughs) um my current guide um who's guided me um in the world championships Lucy Neams and who coaches me is is fantastic and you know so supportive and it's that reassurance of guides you know guides knowing when when I need information and I know my friend Michelle who I've ran with she runs about um you must carry is my running club said like she can actually see when I'm tense because maybe the ground's a bit uneven or maybe the lights changed and that affects my sight my sight I've no sight when it's dark I struggle in glare I struggle in mist so she can tell by looking at me um that I'm starting to struggle that I need more information um and I've just made fantastic friends I go all over the place to park run with a group of guys um, Mark, Mark and Dave um, and they've guided me on some absolutely crazy courses um, <laughs> you know and it is that trust um, that is, is fundamental um, when we did triathlon we were blacked out on the run for three years and I remember the first um, say the first uh, year race I did that was blacked out on the run was the European Championships in Athlon in Ireland and um, We'd, we'd gone around the course the day before, but not blacked out because there was cars and things. And there was quite a steep slope to the river. And yeah, it was quite a different experience going that, down that blindfolded. And I think my guide, Hannah, um, had to do quite a bit of persuasion to go down. And I think literally a lot we run with children's reins as a tether. I think um, she may have had my hand, but the boys also held hands going down that slope. So it obviously just was a yeah it's a scary slope yeah it was um but yeah the guide is the guides are what makes it possible they what help me feel confident enough to to run to run on surfaces that are are difficult they give me information that I wouldn't see so I don't see the mile markers and the marathon's a very long way if you don't see any mile markers um 
you know, I can't read my watch when I'm running, so they can tell me the mile splits. I mean, I know you can get Strava to speak it to you, so that, that's a lesser thing. But it's lots of information. They tell me when water stations are. Um, I've had guides. Um, I remember running, um, I think this was Carla. I, one time when I ran London Marathon, this was before I was competing for GB, um, my guide said, and this was, give me a good bit of a laugh, she said, oh, there's someone running dressed as a tap. And then she went, oh, they're running as wa for water aid. That's appropriate. And it's things like that that just add that bit of humour and it's someone else to share the experience with. And I think when I was winning my triathlon medals with Hannah and with Jenny, it was like, it wasn't just me winning. It was a team. We'd done it as a team. They supported me. And yeah, that was so important. And being with Lucy in London and having all that experience together, it, it's nice to have that as a shared experience. Thank you for answering all my questions. Um, I now have quite a few questions for you from people who've, who've sent them in. Um, of all your sporting achievements, which is your most memorable to date? That's a really difficult question to answer. I think there's three parts to that. Obviously, the first European was a massive breakthrough and a massive excitement. Um, like I said earlier about winning the time when I um, won the Europeans in Ponte Vedra and we had the anthem. But I think probably my greatest achievement is the last Europeans that I won was in Ilat in Israel. Um, and basically um, the, the girl um, who came second, I overtook her with about three, 400 metres to go. Um, and, and she's a very talented athlete. So yeah, I think that probably is, is my best achievement. Um, I'd had a, probably one of the best swims I've ever had. Well, it definitely is the best swim I've ever had. But then actually on the bike, I'd actually felt quite sick. I don't know if I'd swallowed some seawater or what. Um, so then to come back and have the run in a very, very hot, dry conditions, um, it wasn't a particularly quick run, but it was quicker than, than other people in the race. So, um, yeah, that's probably my first achievement. What do you enjoy most about running? Um, two things. I enjoy running with friends and getting the opportunity to spend time with friends. And one of the things, um, you know, as the lockdown eased the last time and, and you know, you were able to then sort of, see people outside so I could run with a friend so the social aspect is massive but sometimes I tend to run in the morning and it's just nice to run by the sea and to appreciate how beautiful um the world is and you know it just gives you that peace and tranquility and, and sometimes it is just nice to you know feel I don't know there's like a little bounce that you feel when you're running really well when you're running really well it just feels amazing do you aspire to take part in any other sports professionally or is running now your passion? Running probably is my passion. I suppose what I would say is it would depend on what other opportunities came up. I mean, I do do trapeze. I do trapeze once a week and I've done some showcases. That's only sort of at a very, very amateur level, but I do enjoy it. Um, I'm not really sure what other sporting opportunities would come up, but then again, I wasn't really expecting... The opportunities that have come up so I suppose yeah if there came an opportunity to try a different sport um then then that would probably be something that I would look at um never say think, never never say never yeah but I think <laughs> I always would have to run because running I don't know I've run for so many years now that it's just sort of part of me really what advice would you give to someone else with sight loss who wants to take part in sport I think I would tell them to believe in themselves if ignore the people and I know it's really challenging ignore the people who maybe are saying you can't do it and to find people who support them with achieving their goals because it's those people that will enable them to move forward it's those people that I remember people in our running club um I have a fantastic running club they are amazing um and I can remember one of the coaches Graham sort of saying a time that he thought was capable of doing the half marathon in and it it was quite early in my running career. I'd not done many half marathons and I was kind of like, no, I don't think that's going to happen. Um, you know, and that type of thing. So yeah, finding the people and sometimes it's hard because you do literally have to kind of keep trying different sports and keep going to different clubs. I think it's better as well when you're older. I think when you're in your early teens, kids want to point out what you're not good at. What I found when I was at uni mm -hmm is that actually people want you to achieve and they want to share in that mm. achievement. And it's more about the group, whereas 
yeah, when you're younger, it's much less about the group. How much training is involved with running a marathon? I think quite a lot. Um, I mean, I suppose it depends in terms of, of what you mean. I typically, if I don't have any injuries, I'd say I typically run about 50 to 60 mile a week. Sometimes if I'm having an easy week, it'll drop back to 40. Um, and then um, when marathon training, it'd definitely be up about the 60 mark. Um, I try and then build in some cycling. Um, that's been a bit more restricted with um, the, the gym situation, but I have just sort of um, resolved that from my own point of view. Um, so I tend to build in some cycling. Like I say, I do trapeze and yoga as cross training. Um, must shout out to my yeah, um, fantastic yoga teacher, Becky, because some arms after a really tough day at work when you just feel like it's one issue after another, there's nothing better than um, doing some yoga. Um, and it does help reduce the risk of injuries. Um, so yeah, um, I normally, if you factor in the running and then um, trapeze and other strength and conditioning and, and yoga, I normally would say I train about at least 10 hours a week, but, but it can be up to sort of 15 hours a week. Um, and that's obviously limited by the fact that I work full time and, and have to kind of do the usual things like um, cleaning my house and cooking my tea and oh no forget about the cleaning cleaning doesn't <laughs> exist during lockdown no just, it's not important uh, another question for you Charlotte are there any plans for the world para athletics marathon championship to take place next year and will you be competing so at this stage um, I don't know the answer to that so the next world championships will be in 2023 the world cups are normally held annually so obviously this year's was cancelled Next year, London Marathon is actually in October. Um, so I'm not really sure whether they would still have the World Cup because our World Cup was totally cancelled. It wasn't postponed. Um, I think it'll be quite some time before we have any answers regarding those things. So predominantly at the moment, I'm training um, and focusing on um, improving my running, improving my pace, different things, different aspects of my running. And then um, I'm hoping that I am entered in a marathon in the spring, which was postponed. So I'm hoping to do that to get a, a good time. And then we'll, we'll sort of see where we go from, from then, really. Um, it, it's sort of a bit uncharted territory, really. Mm. Yeah, it must be uh, It must be difficult. But I suppose everybody's in the same situation, aren't they? We, we yeah. just don't know. If you could give one piece of advice to your younger self, what would you say? I think the biggest thing is a bit around about it being okay. It's okay to be different. It's okay to be not okay, to accept that people are going to not be very nice to you. And yeah, realizing, and also a bit going back to that thing of you can change the future. So it's about, I think I would try and do that. And I also would have been more confident in terms of pushing a bit more to try and get some of the opportunities. So Sometimes people would offer things and I'd think, oh, are they only being nice? And I think I could have been a little bit more proactive and kind of, you know, um, yeah, kind of asking people more for guide to, to guide or to for me to take part in things. I think I let I let the negative influences um, be greater than they could have been. So for you, the future, here you are running marathons you're going to be running marathons hopefully we'll see you in the uh, in the world para athletics championship presumably you'd like to get selected for the paralympics that that must be a goal for you is it yeah i mean i would like to get selected but obviously um spaces are limited and the selectors have to make the decisions that um are going to give great britain the best opportunities to get medals um I personally think that this, you know, it depends on times and, and other people's times. I personally think that the Tokyo Paralympics will probably come too soon. There is a Paralympics in Paris um, in, in less than four years now. Um, and at this stage, um, we don't know the events. Um, Marathon has been in the Paralympics in 2016 and um, would have been in 2020 this year. Um, so 
I would very much like to compete in the Paralympics. I'd probably very much like to compete if there was ever an opportunity in the Commonwealth Games. Um, to some extent, my main focus has to be on improving my times and demonstrating that I have that ability. And then those opportunities, if they're available, will come along. But it's that's only possible if I um, continue to improve and continue to develop as an athlete. And that's sort of my challenge, really, to do that and to, to put all the things in place that I can do to make that possible. And finally, where this kind of all started for you was, <clears throat> aside from doing the, you know, the, the, the circus, which, you know, you terrified your mum about when you were younger. <laughs> but the, the huge turning point for you was coming to the University of York, uh, finding the trampolining club. What, what would you say, I suppose, to um, students and ex-alumni of, of the university about your experience and how important it has been to you to develop you and, and to get you to where you are now? You're an incredible athlete, so much determination. I just feel so lucky and that when I looked at universities and made the decision to come to York, that it, it was definitely the right the right university for me um I loved living in York I loved the campus I just felt there were so many opportunities um I think if you're a student today I know it's a bit difficult with the COVID but literally take every opportunity you get I mean I I did an awful lot of volunteering as well as sport I can remember days where it was like well I'll go running and then I'll go to ballet and then I'll go to yoga and <laughs> Um, and then, you know, other days I might be, you know, I remember I had um, a bit of a crazy um, day one day where we used to run a, a social club for adults with um, like older adults in the community. And then I used to go and befriend an elder who lived over near Fulford and I, was, and I used to help out in a school. And I just think, yeah, university is the best time of your life to have that time because when you're working, it's so hard to try and fit um anything in especially like I say because like basically I worked and I suppose I effectively have a part-time job with training um and then by the time you can say you've done your normal day-to-day -day jobs and, and seen family and friends there's not enough time left but yeah uni's brilliant you can try any sport you want um be as way out as you want I know the university used to have a um underwater hockey club I don't know if they still do um never got around to that one and I did get around to quite a lot of things while I was at uni but I didn't quite get around to underwater ho water hockey um you know and and don't have preconceived ideas I mean I tell you something else I did at uni that was fantastic and a lot of people have preconceived ideas of is pole exercise and that was another really supportive environment and an environment that sort of made me recognize strengths that they felt I had so yeah try everything and I just think the university is a fantastic university um and that you know some of the people that I met and have had the privilege to know um, you know, I had a very supportive supervisor, Susan, um, with my degree, and I had some fantastic housemates and friends. So, yeah, just embrace the university. Charlotte Ellis, it's been an absolute honour and a privilege to hear about your life. You really are truly inspirational. And I think in these times, we all need an inspirational story. We wish you and I wish you continued success for the future. Thank you very much for uh, talking to us at the University of York as part of the Open Lectures series and good luck. We'll be watching out for you. Oh, thank you very much. It's been a privilege to be asked. Thank you and thank you for your time.